Bible, turn to the first book of the Bible with me, chapter 3, book of Genesis. First book of the Pentateuch, written by Moses. Book you're reading is about 3,400 years old. Somewhere in there. The Hebrew word is Bereshith. It means in the beginning. Chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, in direct contradiction to what God said, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Father, bless this book in your holy name. Amen. You can be seated. There are a number of gardens in the Bible. Of course, this is the first one. The scripture says God planted a garden eastward in Eden. The word Eden in itself means delight. So the garden of delight planted eastward in Eden. Essentially, the place called the Valley of Mesopotamia, which means the land between the rivers. It's what's called a fertile crescent. It's where Abraham came from when God called him from Ur the Chaldees. And he went north through Haran and came on down into the south. This land stretches all the way from the Tigris and Euphrates River in the east to the Great Sea, which is called the Great Sea in the Bible, the Mediterranean Sea. So the land of Eden, eastward in Eden, is a huge land, piece of land. And the garden that was placed, put here, God made the man and put him in the garden. Scripture said he put him there to dress it and to keep it. So therefore he was given a responsibility and something to do. God never made man to lie around, sit around all day long. You were made for a purpose. He gave you a brain, gave you abilities, and you must use these. And this garden planted eastward in Eden is the garden of trial and temptation. Because Satan, our enemy, shows up. How do you know that's the devil, preacher? Because the apostle says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And referring to, certain, uh, to Satan and this serpent as identifies them as one and the same. The word serpent in Hebrew is the, is the Hebrew word nachash. It's important to understand this because there's so much about it that I believe is misunderstood. The word means a brilliant shining thing. Something that is upright, walking about. Truth of the matter is, if you've ever noticed some of the serpents on this earth... They have some of the most brilliant uh, colors that you'll see anywhere. And many say that that itself uh, goes back to the fact that they must have come, and come from a common source of beauty and color and all that. And so we have find here a nakash walking around on its two legs. And you'll notice that when God cursed it, he said he put it on the ground and said, you'll crawl on the ground. You'll, you'll eat dust. Even in the millennium when God restores uh, the animal creation, the serpent is never restored. In Greek, it's ophis, and this is idolatry. They've worshipped the serpent from ages past. It's always associated with wisdom and knowledge. And we find it here in the book of Genesis, the Lord doth know, God doth know. In other words, revealing wisdom to Eve and then ultimately to Adam. But it's temptation, folks, and it's one of the many ways that Satan can use to tempt us and to gain access into our soul and into our spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted of Satan for 40 days. Once he'd been anointed and entered upon his ministry, Satan was there waiting for him in the wilderness. Our parents failed the temptation. The Lord Jesus Christ passed the temptation. Adam is the first one made from the dust of the ground. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam, man, became a living soul. Breath, therefore, is associated with man in a very peculiar and particular way. And in Lord willing, if God can change my mind, we'll be talking about that in the service tonight in the message about breath. And I want you to think about in Acts chapter number 2, a rushing mighty wind 
that came down upon the church of God when he gave it life and it began. So God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. This breath that was breathed into Adam's nostrils was created for the man. God doesn't need to breathe. He doesn't need anything that he creates. God is before creation. He abides within himself. He needs nothing. He doesn't need us. We need him. We need to understand that today. I hear preachers talking all the time. God needs you. God doesn't need you. <laughs> he doesn't need you. You're here for a vapor. You're coming. You're good. You're coming. You're gone. You need him. Amen. Amen. Anything you have, you received of the Lord. The Bible says plainly. But it's something to think about here because we have a creature that is, that is tempting to sin. And somebody said, well, now sin started in the garden. No, it didn't start there, folks. It started long before there. Sin started in the heavens. It started above us. According to the book of Ezekiel, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I've set thee so. And he said, that was perfect in thy days when I made you till sin entered into your heart and to your soul. So in the finest of environments, in the greatest of places, in the highest places of authority and ability, sin had its origins, folks. That flies in the face of men who say, well, change the man's environment and you'll change him. No, my dear friend, change the man and you'll change his environment. Let that sink in. <laughs> Amen. So the issue, my friend, started long above and before us. Satan is our enemy, always has been, always will be. His name, Satan, is a Hebrew word, and it literally means adversary, your enemy, one that is against you. So there's no pretty picture painted here of the devil. He comes across as our enemy, and he comes across as wily. He's, we know the wiles of the devil. He's cunning. He knows how to counter what God says. He knows how to work against the revealed truth of the Almighty. That's Satan's greatest power. He is not a, he is not a creator. He is not an inventor. He cannot bring from nothing. But Satan can surely pervert what has been. That's how he deals with your soul and with your spirit. So this sin had already come into existence. As you've uh, said to you time and time again, there are five casting downs of Satan out of heaven from his original position. He was cast down in Ezekiel 28 as the anointed cherub that covereth. Then the Lord Jesus said in Luke 10, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's where he came from, the second heavens. And then the, th and then the first heaven in Ephesians 2, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon in Revelation chapter number 12. This is coming. He'll be cast out of that heaven too. And his final downfall will be in the lake of fire, according to the book of Revelation, chapter number 20 and verse number 10. But the fourth downfall is when he is cast into the bottomless pit and there for a thousand years to be held captive. Satan is progressively losing his power and his authority. The Bible in the book of Revelation says he knoweth he hath but a short time. And we're approaching that short time. We may very well be in that short time. We may be knocking on the door of the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may be so soon. It may be as soon as a heartbeat away. Amen. I hope it doesn't scare you. I hope it encourages you. It fires up my soul. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Again, the Bible in the book of Genesis gives us a glimpse into the spirit world. As I mentioned to you, a Nakash, a upright, beautiful, shining being, intelligent and cunning and wily that approaches Eve. Note carefully, he approached the woman. Now, I want to get into all that doctrine in the New Testament, but it was to the woman, Isha in Hebrew, the woman, not the man. And he came to the woman. And of course, it shows us a great truth here also. Adam knew the moment he looked at his wife, his bride, that she had sinned. Something had changed about her appearance. And Adam made a choice that day. And that choice was the fact that he is such a type of Christ. He chose to die for his bride. Amen. You take her, Lord, then you're going to have to take me too. Well, I could make another bride for you. No, 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 no. I'm a one woman man. <laughs> The Lord Jesus is a one woman man. He has but one bride, amen. Not many, make no mistake about that whatsoever. He's called the great red dragon. He's called an angel of light. And Lucifer in the book of Isaiah, which is a Latin word, means light bearer. 
and he's called Leviathan in the book of Job and Behemoth in the book of Job, a composite of different creatures that make up this creature that we're talking about. And make no mistake about it, he is a creature. There is but one creator. There is but one almighty everlasting God. He is so far above his creation, he cannot be known, he cannot be approached, he cannot be understood, he cannot even be conceived unless he reveals himself to us. The only thing that we'll ever know about God is what he reveals. Can't thy by searching find him out? No, you can't, folks. He's still bigger than you imagine in your mind. How big is he this morning? He's bigger than that. How great is God today? He's still greater than that. Amen. Ah, my God is not something created in the farm somewhere, some homespun theology. My God is El Shaddai. He's almighty God from everlasting to everlasting. This creature that he has created, this creature, this Satan is not the opposite of God. He's not the counterforce and power to almighty God. No, in way whatsoever, all God would have to do is just will it and Satan would cease to exist in a moment of time. But we do have a purpose for Satan, the anointed cherub that covereth. I want you to remember something about the spirit world. The spirit world is this angel. The Greek word is angelos. It is one who comes down. Angels are found from Genesis through Revelation in the word of God. Angels. Angelic being is a, is a, is a, is a kind of a term that is simply a generic term that it refers to, for example, a seraphim, a cherubim, an angel, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. These are generic terms of spirit beings and the word angel can be used in a sense to describe them. But an angel, my friend, that is a created being like Michael and Gabriel is an angel in itself. It is a unique individual. It's a unique being. It's something that exists because God created it for a purpose. The word angel itself mostly means a messenger, one that is sent forth with a messenger. But it means more, far more than that. It can be much greater. For example, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of God. It's a manifestation of the Almighty or at best a manifestation of the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he was incarnate in flesh, walked this earth. Before he was incarnated as a man, the Lord Jesus Christ could take the form of a man. He could appear as a man. He was the angel of the Lord. Now think about it for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ is not an angel, but the word angel of the Lord simply refers to what I'm trying to say to you. It has a greater meaning than simply a being. It has a, it has a, it has a broader meaning. For example, an angel is the spirit manifestation of a human being. When Rhoda went to the door, Peter that it was in jail. He, she went to the door and there stood Peter and the people were inside praying. And she said, here's Peter, he's at the door. And they said, no, it's his angel. What did they mean by that? What did they mean by his angel? The Bible says in the book of John chapter number three, our father, the son which is in heaven, well, when he was talking about him being in heaven, he was on this earth also. You see a spirit being, folks, a spirit being lives in an area of uncertainty, in other words, uncertainty to the mind of a human being, we cannot define a spirit. There is no way that you can break down the essence of a spirit being. This is why I quoted uh, uh, Spurgeon last week. When in 18 and 40, he was talking about this. We do not know the essence of a spirit. Therefore, we do not know the actual essence of God. But what we do know about God right now is that that spirit being, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, has crossed a barrier and has manifested himself in human flesh, and God has become a man. And he is the man, Christ Jesus, but he's fully man and he's fully God. Amen. And if you don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God, then you belong to the Aryan crowd and you belong to that bunch of heretics that lived in the first century after Christ and you're denying his deity and all the rest that goes with it. The Lord Jesus Christ is almighty God walking in flesh among men. That's who he is. So when it talks about his angel, it talks about children. And it says their angel doth behold the face of our father which is in heaven. Well, how can this be? The spirit of that child, since the spirit is not bound to one place, we don't know the essence of a spirit. 
That spirit can be here and it can also be in the presence of Almighty God manifesting itself. This is why God as a spirit being can be anywhere and everywhere at the same time. Now before I get off into a pit somewhere (laughs) and get way out in left field, I'll leave it there. But here's what I'll leave with you. Before you go home today, do some serious praying about what, ask God, say, Lord, would you show me what the essence of a spirit is? Somebody said, well, it's like fire, it's like wind. That's, that, my friend, is a type. That's a picture, but that's not the essence of it. And so we have it. And then a separate human being. Someone may walk into this house. They may come in here and sit down and sit next to you. They may sing in the choir. They may hear in the preaching, or they may even get up and preach. And did you know what? Be careful. You may entertain angels unaware. Say, boy, preacher, you're getting us off into some kind of, well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That's what it said. And I'm a Bible believer. I'm a Bible believer before I'm a Baptist, before I'm a Methodist, before I'm a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, or an I am a Bible believer and a student of the scriptures. And I pray, Lord God, open mine eyes and my soul and my spirit that I might learn from your word. So the battle rages and most are completely oblivious to it. They are, folks, even I and you, which we depend. And here's the problem. You've heard me preach this to you so many times. Most people that go to church are trusting in their mind and their heart in their walk with God. How many agree with that? Instead of trusting in God's revealed word. Amen. You say, you mean your mind can be wrong? Yeah, mine can. You mean to tell me that your heart can deceive you? Yeah, mine can. What about yours? So I cannot depend upon my mind and my heart to know that I have a right relationship with the Lord. So how do you do it, preacher? You take this book, get on your face, you pray to God and you ask the Lord God Almighty to move that word into your heart and into your soul. And if it speaks differently from what you think, then take what God says about it. Amen. And that, of course, is another lesson altogether in itself. The battle rages. For example, do you remember the prophet Balaam? Do you remember the prophet Balaam? And you remember how blind he was to the will of God? Well, his donkey knew more than he did. Amen. So maybe some of them out in the barnyard out here got better sense than some of us have when it comes to serving the Lord. Amen. So he, uh, oh, you remember the prophet who said to the young man in the, in, the, in the room with him as the enemy came, said, oh, Lord, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, what did he see? He saw the hills full. Of the angels of God. Amen. So I say this morning, Lord, open my eyes and our eyes that we might be able to see. Satan is a devouring foe. He devours. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. His, his ultimate goal was to make a mockery of God and his word and his saint. Those that he had just created. Satan's purpose was to mock them, make fun of them. And then be able to look up in the face of God and shake his hand and say, I've proven you're wrong. It's what Job, the Lord said to the Lord, said to the Lord uh, Satan said to the Lord, what? God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, yeah, I've thought all about him, but you've got a hedge built around him. He's not serving you because he loves you. He's serving you because he's rich. You've blessed him. All of this, you take that away and he'll curse you to your face. Are you getting a hold now of what's going on between God and Satan? If you're angry at God, and I'm going to read something for you in just a moment. I hope some of you can handle it. I really do. I watch, I I get on, I've gotten, I've gotten now into practically daily. I go on the internet and I go on to the YouTube, and I go on to the messages that have been preached here at Temple, and you have all these comments underneath, and I start reading them. And I'll read a couple, and I'll stop and pray. I'll read some more, and I'll stop and pray. I'll read another, and I'll stop and pray. My heart begins to move. And I read another one, and I stop and pray. And I think to myself, my goodness gracious, if our people at Temple only knew how many people are watching this? They're, re- they're, caught, they're crying out to God. They won't help. And I stop and I pray. Folks, I, I, listen, please take this the right way. There's probably a thousand people right now watching what's going on. Or there may be 5,000. There may be 10,000. Who knows? And this church is ministering to them. And I want you to be part of that ministry. 
If you're angry at God, you ever been mad at him? Satan's devouring you. If you're down and your friends are forsaking you, you're in hell. Because when your friends turn against you, all the people you trusted, you built your life around them. You opened your heart to them. They became part of what goes, you know, they became part of you. You trusted them. Yeah, your innermost being. And yet they turned on you. Satan's devouring you. If you're suicidal, oh boy, does it ever happen every day. The suicide rate in this country skyrocketing. And here's what really bothers you. Among teenagers, young people, skyrocketing. If you're suicidal, Satan's devouring you. If you're bitter and full of hate, oh, how it'll eat. Eat like a cancer. If you're bitter and full of hate, Satan is devouring you. Amen. If you're smug in your religious success, you've attained. Satan is devouring you. Pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. If you are self-absorbed in your superior religious knowledge, have you ever been around someone like that? They graced you long enough with their presence to overwhelm you with their great knowledge of the Bible. You ever been around somebody like that? And some of you are laughing, I don't blame you. <laughs> but Satan is devouring you if that's who you are. If you're secure in your righteous life, <coughs> When you came to church today and got up in the choir and sang with the saints and you read your Bible in this afternoon and you know, you're fine. Nothing, you know, why do you want me to repent? I got nothing to repent of. <laughs> well, join up with me, friend. I got plenty. <laughs> Amen. I'm serious as a heart attack. If you're not bothered anymore with a voice of God speaking into your soul, wanting to talk to you and commune with you. Go back to 1 John 1. I beat it to death week after week. Go back in there and look at that. Sin originates spiritually within the soul before the deed is ever perpetrated. And then, if you're secure in your righteous life, Satan's devouring you. If Christ to you is part of your religious world, the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, and you can always tell when he's just a word that is so, you used it so much. There's no love there. There's no love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what makes us who we are. That's what Maranatha is about. Those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. He bore your sin on that cross. He became sin for you who knew no sin, suffered your hell. And my dear friend, if you don't love him for that, what do you love for anything? That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Satan is devouring you. Now, we have a covenant with God. I'm so thankful for it this morning. So what is it? Well, the covenant we have is called the New Testament. Hakene diatheke. That's all it is. It means to cut a covenant. All right. The word is translated two ways in the New Testament. One is covenant. The other is testament. This is the New Testament in my blood, he said to them. Same word. Hakene diatheke. Then in the book of Hebrews, the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter number 8, talking about Israel when he ratifies it with them, okay? Same word, but it is applied to a different period of time. You following me? So the covenant that I'm under this morning is the new covenant of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a blood covenant. It's not a covenant of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So the power of the covenant of, blood, of the blood of bulls and goats is limited in its effect. How many would agree with that? But the power of the covenant of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is unlimited. Amen. When it comes to forgiveness, it's full, complete, forever. And it can never be drugged back up into your face again. If he forgives you, you're forgiven, dear friend. If the blood of Christ washes your sins away, they're washed. In the Old Testament, you have Jehovistic combinations. What's that? That's Jehovah. Let me explain to you. Yod, He, Val, He. These are four consonants, okay? That's what's called the Tetragrammaton. You've heard me say it a thousand times, but it's important today because they're assaulting it. How do you pronounce four consonants? You can't do it. You've got to have a vowel. So what happens? Well, the Masorites, the Masorites took the vowels 
from Adonai, which is Lord. And they took the Seghol, uh, Holamwau, Kamasatuf, they took these vowels and they added them to the four Hebrew consonants. And here's how they pronounced that. Yehovah. In English, we say Jehovah. Now, they've come along today, and it's all Yahweh. Now, I'm not up here to blast somebody for saying Yahweh. You know, a lot of good people, no doubt, do that. No question. But I just be me. I just love to put a little quirk in there to make you think. Just enough for you to go off somewhere and say, now, what's that preacher talking about? See, that's, I mean, I am. I agree. I mean. But just enough. Just, just enough. To just make you think. But anyway, you have Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Kadosh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shama. These are what's called Jehovistic combinations. Jehovah Saboth, Jehovah Ra'a. In other words, God says, I'll come into a covenant relationship with you based on the blood of bulls and goats. And I shall offer myself up on my part. I will keep my part of the deal. And so when he talked to Jehovah, he said, I, he said, at the top of that mountain when Abraham took Isaac. You remember that? And God revealed himself. He gave his name to him. What name did he use? Anybody? Somebody tell me. Can you tell me what name he used? He said, I am Jehovah Jireh. Exactly. That means God will provide. He provided an animal coming up the other side. Well, let me tell you something. Every last one of these Jehovistic combinations find their fulfillment, completion, and, and real value in the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is every one of them to us. This is important. This is the, part, the important part about it, okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's Jehovah Sitkanu. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's Jehovah Nissi. He's Jehovah. All these Jehovistic combinations, he is to us everything we need from Almighty God. There is nothing we need from God outside of Christ. I was thinking about the Sabbath day, and I know I'll make people mad by saying this. And there are those who keep the Sabbath, all right? I do, say, do you fall out and get mad at them? No, I don't. Do not. The Apostle Paul said plain in the book of Romans, let man, if one man esteemeth one day above another, let him esteem one, but that's fine. No problem. No problem whatsoever. No problem. But folks, you'll never get the rest in a day that you'll get in the sun. And the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that Christ is our Sabbath. Yes. Not a day, but a person. Amen. Now, this is posted under the YouTube videos. I want you to listen to what I'm going to read to you now. And uh, some of this is, not e this is not easy, but it's important. YouTube videos. You remember when I mentioned about some of uh, the people who watch uh, pornography? Figure go 40, 30, 40, 50 percent. Of the people in the church houses are watching pornography. I hope people on YouTube understand I'm not telling you to watch pornography. Did I ever tell you to watch pornography? No, sirree. And to say otherwise is to lie and misrepresent. But if you are watching pornography, I did say this to you. Why don't you stop and start praying for that when you're watching Think about what I just said to you. One person commented this. Think on this. Some of the individuals on porn sites are victims of sex trade. They're threatened that their families will be killed if they don't comply. It's rape now, not porn stars, but exploitation of the innocent. This person commented about that. I want to try to give you just a little bit in a minute to show you what's going on in this world. You understand, don't you, in some of these countries that they sell their little girls into prostitution? How many of you know that? They sell them into prostitution. There's one on BBC. I watched her the other day. She was talking about how that her family was going to sell her into prostitution, and she managed to escape Afghanistan. She managed to escape the country and to get out of it, and God bless her soul. She was able to get away from it, and she wasn't sold into prostitution. 
Bad stuff, isn't it? It's hard for Western civilization, folks here in America, to wrap your mind around the fact that you could take your daughters, your young daughters, and sell them into prostitution. But that happens all the time. Now here's where it gets worse. These girls that are coming across the border into this country, southern border, many of those kids are being trafficked. Human trafficking. Okay? This is from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. This is a federal website, okay? I didn't create this, but I'm going to read what it says. Human trafficking. 2000, Congress signed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act into law, representing the beginning of a large-scale coordinated effort of the United States government to fight human trafficking. Twenty years later, human trafficking still remains prevalent according to recent figures available. Quotes the figures September 17, 2017. Now I want to go quickly down to this. Out of the 24.9 million people trapped in forced labor, 16 million people are exploited in the private sector, such as domestic work, construction or agriculture, or 4.8 million persons in forced sexual exploitation. Human trafficking, a lot of things they list here as human trafficking, and one of them is to perform a sex act for money or anything of value. Would these cartels that sell these kids across the border, would they sell them into human trafficking? Or well, what if they're buying them? <laughs> if they're selling them, then somebody's buying them, right? So why would you buy some child? You see what I mean? Of course. Human trafficking, hotline, another website. I thought I'd check this out. In one year, from January the 1st, 2020, to December the 31st, 2020, 51,667 notifications came in by text and by all different manners of, uh, of, uh, of media, phone calls and so forth, web chat, online tip reports, emails, to report incidences of human trafficking. This is just the United States, 51,667. It's happening right now. Your daughter could wind up being sold into prostitution. Your daughter could run away from your home. Your daughter could be, could be drug off by some lover and wind up on the street. Your daughter could wind up anywhere in any kind of a situation that defies the very imagination of your soul this morning to think it could happen. It can happen. It can happen. Listen to this, Pastor. I've never asked or even shared personal info regarding my life, but I feel led to today. Let me say this now before I go any further. This was posted publicly. I am not giving any names out. Don't ask me. But I want to give you the case. I want you to hear what these people are saying when they post this, okay? I want you to hear what they're saying. But I feel led today. I ask for prayer, please. I've been dealing with physical and mental health issues that began several years ago. From, I believe, stress of my very unhealthy marriage, financial issues, unexpected death of my sister and aunt who helped raise me, and then my brother was murdered. And 18 months later, my son-in-law. I was in a very dark place then by God's mercy and love. Can you imagine? He pulled me out of the pit, and I gave everything I am to him. I so desire to be close to our Lord, but I'm dealing with heavy spiritual warfare. Notice carefully now. You remember the war of attrition? He's been brought out, but he's still fighting. See what I mean? He needs support, doesn't he? Spiritual attacks are through family, sickness, and even physical attacks of the demonic realm. I love the Lord but feel so overwhelmed and in fear for, my re for no reason, I guess from PTSD. I talk to Jesus all through the day and read his word and have repented for who I used to be. I need prayer, please, for strength and understanding. God bless you and your congregation. Thank you for being a loyal servant of the Most High and explaining to us what our Father and Savior wants us to know. All right. 
This is a person who has been watching the YouTube ministry of Temple Baptist Church. And nobody's met this person. I've never met them. But these are people out there, real people living real lives, crying out for help. Okay? A believer answered. And I love to see this. They're on the web. They read this and they post underneath it. Here's the answer from a person. Praying for supernatural healing and protection. I too suffered from PTSD. You see, you minister what you've been ministered to. See how it works? I began to fight. I began to embroider, then drawing and coloring. Daily walks. Now I have a new pup and started a YTube channel. God is restoring me. Line upon line, precept upon precept. God is able. He gets all the glory. And I pray for your release, protection, wisdom, and greatness until his soon return. Praise the Lord. Let me put that in Hebrew. Hallelujah. I noticed something about it said, began to embroider. If you'd have asked me a few weeks ago what that was, I didn't have a clue. What is embroidering, I thought. Well, I've had a problem with my buttons popping off of my shirts. And so I have to sew them back on. I've got a sewing machine that I've had for over 50 years. Seriously. I thought to myself, you know, it'd be nice if I could sew a button on with that sewing machine. So you know what I did? I got on YouTube. I started doing a little research. I found out that there's a thing called a presser foot that's made for buttons and that you can put that button underneath that presser foot and that you can set it on zigzag and get the width of it correct and you can take that thing and you can fire it up and it'll go just like this and it'll sew that button on. And when I saw that, I mean, it like blew me away. I mean, that was amazing. Just bang, 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 that button was sewn on. Then I got real brave. I thought, okay, if that thing will sew a button on like that, what about hemming my trousers? <laughs> so I did a little more research. <laughs> I got back on YouTube and there's a lot of different ways, methods that you can use to hem your trousers. I found one that looked good for a newbie. I mean newbie, folks. I am a newbie. And so I got, I got my sewing machine out and I got it out and I measured everything where you're supposed to measure and got on the sewing machine with it and I Sold all the way around, and I got my trousers hemmed, believe it or not. Yeah, I got them. I got them on. <laughs> yeah. I thought, that turned out pretty good. I didn't have to get anybody to do it. Did it myself. But here's the point. I've been going through hell, too. And I've set my affection and my mind on something that's productive. What can I do? See, are you going through hell? What can you do? See, I didn't know anything about sewing. Good night, man. I didn't know anything. I didn't know, and know very little now, but I've learned a good bit and a whole lot more than I did know. And I found out that sewing is a big world. Man, people make garments. They make backpacks. They sew leather. They got all kinds of, they, I mean, all different types of sewing machines for different kinds of work. Didn't know all of that stuff existed. But I got in it, and I started looking at it, and I got that old sewing machine out, and I started sewing. I learned how to sew a straight line and stitch, and I found out that the thread on the top and the bobbin on the bottom, they both have to have the same pressure, the same uh, resistance. That way you get a good stitch, and I learned all this stuff, and I thought to myself, man, alive, but I got my mind into it. It helped me. It helped me. Now, I don't know how many sewers we got in here. If we got any, you're better than me, believe me. That's how you start restoring somebody. Get your mind off of your problem and start applying yourself. Now listen to what I'm about to read for you. Again, this is addressed to me. Come closer to me, yada, yada. No, it's your turn, blank. You get off your most high horse and get down here and fix this problem you created. What's this preacher? This man is talking to God. Are you listening? Now listen, this is the real world. This didn't come from some religious publication make people feel good. I'm trying to reach you. Yea, 
I blame you this time, your fingerprints, Levens and eights and Jezebel herself all over this blank. I'm so mad at you right now. I did everything, fell for every trick, came right back begging, screaming, beating my steering wheel, crying my eyes out, and back to screaming. Plus you hear the volume in my mind right now at you. Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. Yah brought me food and gas, then closed every door except the same blank job again. Plus, you've murdered any hope, thoughts, or even want of a wife. You really blank me over this time. Good. I'm a loss everything. Everything here soon. Everything. House, car, clothes, food. You're going to make me have no choice but to walk out of town or die in it. And I don't give a blank about either anymore. Thanks, God. Is that a mad person? They're angry. They're very angry. How do you deal with that? All right, here's how you deal with it. Pray for this man. Don't condemn him. It's not your place to judge him. You don't know his situation. Pray for him. Pray for him. You don't know that in a year or two, you may be saying the same things. That's right. Let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed. You may be ready to put a gun to your head and blow your brains out. I've seen it happen before, more than once. You wouldn't believe the preachers that have committed suicide. I am not God's high sheriff and his district attorney. They both certainly have their place. Yes, they do, folks. This is me talking now. How many times have I said it to you? I'm not the sheriff and I'm not the district, the prosecuting attorney. That's who that is. They've got their place. They've got their purpose. Absolutely. This is in no way casting aspersions upon these people. I am God's messenger and happy to be so. I have a suggestion. Please take it from my heart and I'll close. You want to hear it? Get off Facebook and start doing something constructive with your life. Read these comments and start a prayer life. Pray for this man right here. That's so angry. Pray for him. Pray for this man who's had this murder in his family. And folks, this is just two. If you want something constructive to do, there's about, oh, I don't know now, I have no idea how many channels are playing the, 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 the preaching and the Sunday school teaching and everything that comes out of temple. It's online. And people comment underneath there. They're looking for something. They want help. Boy, wouldn't it be a good ministry if you... So if you subscribed to, the, to these channels and that you were there quoting scripture and not as, not, as, not as a Pharisee, but as somebody who shows real compassion and love and you want to help these people, you might be surprised at how through helping them, you get help. Amen. Through helping them, you get blessed. Amen. Amen. And it always blessed me just to pray for them. And I'll pray and I'll go home and I'll pray and then I'll read more. And I'll pray and I'll get, get down four or five and stop and start praying again. And I'll pray and I'll pray. Why? That's what I'm supposed to do. You tend to this and leave these men to the ministry of the word. That's what he said to the apostles. You let them take care of reading the Bible, prayer, seeking the face of God for you. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's my calling. Why don't you answer it today? Father, in Jesus' name, I'm done. I've given them what you gave me, and I'm fully persuaded that you did. I'm done. Maybe somebody in this house needs to answer the call. They know what I'm saying is right. They know it is. They know that Facebook has just turned them bitter. It's made them, it's made them, it's made them angry. It's, it's, it's caused a spirit to come upon them, come into their home, and no good is coming of it. I'm not saying Facebook, Facebook can't be used for good. I know it can be, Lord. I know that. But I also know probably the most, most of it is not. Most of it's not. I pray for them. I pray that they would take what I've said this morning to heart. And they would start reading this. And then answering these people. And showing them real Christian love. Because Lord there is a ministry here that is worldwide. If they want to reach out to people. There's plenty to do. In your holy name. In Jesus name. I ask you this morning. Would you do it? Would you do it?
That man that is so angry, you know what he needs? He needs people to comment underneath him, show him compassion, show him love, show him patience. He has to vent. He's got to get that off of him. Got to get that, get it off of him. How many has ever been mad at God? You might in here have been mad at God. Well, of course you have. I have. Been mad at him. Oh, you hurt God's feelings. No, no, he's bigger than that, folks. He's much bigger than that. You want to do something about it this morning? Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you come down here and pray? We'll be glad if you want somebody to pray with you. We'll be glad to pray with you. Anybody? If you want to come down and pray, we'll pray with you. What do we got, brother? Page 368, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. The blood of the covenant of Christ. That blood covenant. That's the one. What can wash away my sin?